It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 91, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Brooke Salvaggio and Daniel Hurrier own Herbivore, one of the nation's largest urban farmsteads. With 13 acres in the urban core of Kansas City, Missouri, Herbivore produces vegetables, berries, tree fruits, and laying hens on an energy-independent piece of land with a meth house just down the street. We dig into their mulch-based no-till production system, which doesn't require much digging, including the nuts and bolts of how they handle different crops, source appropriate materials, and manage fertility. Because their production system also relies on the incorporation of a 200 hen laying flock, we also dig into the challenges of managing egg production alongside of the vegetables. And a goose comes into the story, too. Brooke and Daniel share how they developed their off-the-grid infrastructure, including an engineered filtration system to draw potable water from a pond on their farm. We also discuss the impacts of bringing a second child into the family and onto the farm, and the challenges of building a farm from the ground up with minimal debt load. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. And by BCS America. BCS two wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com. Brooke Salvaggio and Daniel Hurrier, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. So glad you guys could join us today. So I thought it'd be great to have start off by having you tell us a little bit about Herbivore Farm. Kind of give us the setting of where you are and what you're doing and, and how you're doing it. Sure. Okay. So Herbivore Urban Farm is a 13 and a half acre urban farm in Kansas City's urban core. And it's a pretty big space for an urban, uh, an urban land. Um, we grow about, we have about five acres in orchards, and then we do about two to three acres in vegetables and specialty crops. And um, we also do a lot of other cool stuff. We run a citywide composting program. Um, we sell at farmers markets around town, and we host lots of volunteers. Um, people, people living in the city, you know, they have access to a farm or close in. And yeah, it's a pretty, pretty unique situation. Um, we have some livestock. We have about 200 laying hens that rotate around the farm and fertilize our fields. And um, we grow using no-till farming practices. So our land has has never been, you know, um, cultivated with a tractor blade. So it's pretty pretty unique. So when you say no-till, can you just tell us a little bit more about what that means? Because I found that, you know, for some people, no-till means that you never turn the soil at all. For other people, it does mean that you didn't put a tractor on it. Sure. Yeah, we have. Well, we're not. It, you know, we're purists to some degree, but not 100%. We have never plowed it or tilled it with equipment. Um, when we first got the land, it was pretty thick pasture grasses, uh, fescue, clover mostly. And what we did was we basically mowed it, um, put down compost and some fertility, and then we layered straw on top of straw about maybe a foot and a half thick on top of the ground, let that break down. We did this maybe in you know September, August, September, the season before, let that break down all fall, all through the winter, and then we kind of pull back the straw and plant right into the ground. So that's how our system has sort of existed ever since. We will take things like a heavy hoe and turn over beds. Um, and definitely fork out, you know, perennial weeds and things like that. But, but yeah, no, I, I, I guess I would say there's been no, um, no equipment run through our beds and everything's pretty much hand powered. Yeah, some people will do it, no till into like cover crops and things like that, which they have tilled in to get the cover crops. We're not doing doing that. We're just um, we're, we're never breaking the ground. Brooke, you said that your farm is located in the urban core of Kansas City. So can you can you kind of situate that for us? Yeah, absolutely. So we're about five miles east from the city center, I'd say. Um, so so it's it's extremely close in, and that technically is still considered the city's urban and core. Um, and around us, we, you know, we sit up really high on this hill and it's kind of, it's, it's beautiful land. It's, it's slopes. It's great for orchards. Um, we can kind of, we can see downtown and surrounding city center from some of the higher points on our land. So 
it's very it's kind of epic feeling um around us we have residential neighborhoods and then some light industrial stuff happening um but it certainly you know it feels it feels very pastoral when you're out working in the fields because it is 13 and a half acres so it's big and you're definitely you know sort of buffered from the city but at the same time um you're not that buffered you know we it's we live in a pretty exciting neighborhood there's shootings from time to time and you know there's a mess house down the street you got the organic farm you got the mess house it's all you know so there's, it, there's sirens and there's i don't know kind of funny things that happen to us every day um you know that very much puts it in the context of this urban farm you know the pastoral in juxtaposition to urban life and it's i mean it, frankly it's kind of hilarious you know <laughs> so, so that might paint a little bit of a picture of our of our farm life and how long have you been at your current location um since 2010 is when we started prepping the land 2011 was our first season in production here and then before that you, were both of you farming at a different location? Yeah, yeah, we were. We um, we had I had started what I call my little mini farm in South Kansas City in a more upscale neighborhood, which that's its own issue. But I did that for four years, and about two years into that, Dan joined me, and then we got kind of booted off our our little mini farm, and that's when we found the land that is now herbivore. And how did you find your current piece of land? Um, well, I, you know. It's it's very tricky to find um, as large a piece of land as this in the, in the urban core. Um, but um, Google Maps actually was a big help. We just sort of um, did the uh, Google Earth over over portions of, of the city, and we're looking at larger pieces of land. And a lot of times, they end up being like parks or cemeteries or something like that um, that were you know cleared pieces of land. Um, but that, in combination, there's like a local county land trust that you know um, has larger pieces of land. And I was looking at some county land trust sites which often are wooded um, and uh, said, hey, what's that really big piece of land over there? And, um, and so we, we, found, we found it, you know, the actual physical space that way. But then in addition to that, we, we looked at the property ownership and um, on this site and several other sites that we looked at, there, were, there was the same property owner, which was this um, housing organization called um, the Housing and Financial Development Financial Corporation. And um, they were just, they would develop low-income housing, senior housing, things like that um, back in the 90s and early 2000s, and um, they ended up getting busted for um, some money laundering and, and some, you know, dirty practices. And, yeah, and um, so their their whole operation went into federal court and receivership, and um, all this land, like, like you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of land, uh, hundreds of acres of land um, around the city uh, went into receivership and was just kind of bound up with red tape and when we approached them you know they kind of told us what we would need to do to get that which ended up not being totally true but you know we kind of we kind of um jumped through all this red tape and had to you know contact some council city council members and really try to pull every string that we could to un unwind the, the red tape around this land and then finally eventually after um you know close to a year of, of struggling to get it we finally finally got it and bought it and, you know, started developing it. It was, it was very much a bureaucratic nightmare trying to get this piece of land. Um, and interestingly enough, I mean, you know, in so many ways, it's so urban agriculture, there's all these bullet points as to why it's important, you know, and, and uh, I'd say we definitely live up to all those bullet points with this piece of land in particular, because during the time the land was in receivership, it was, you know, the city was managing it um, poorly, just like you do, and they were spending $20,000 a year to keep this place mowed. So that was, you know, they did that for about 20 years. So you do the math, that's a ton of money, and that was KTMO residence tax dollars, and and then, you know, to date, now that we've owned the land, you know, it's raw land when we got it and we sort of transformed it into this holistic working farm. And to date, it's produced, you know, over $400,000 worth of food. So you can start to understand like, wow, we could really do a lot more with our resources, you know, if we exercise them and, and do things right. So we're, we're definitely, you know, proud of that. We, we feel really good about what we've done here. So $400,000 in... I guess it would be six growing seasons now, right? 
Yeah. So, and that's, you got to understand, um, this was raw land and we decided to build it from scratch with our own two hands. So that, that amount of food was grown without any water or electricity. I mean, no bells and whistles on the farm. Um, you know, in our first season, we were able to get a massive deer fence up, which was major and get a parking lot put in and start our citywide composting program. And then we spent the last four consecutive winters building an off-grid home. It's an earth burn past a solar home. We just got a 10 kilowatt solar system out here. Um, we've got our walk-in cooler built finally. We've got we've got our off-grid water system built, our potable water system. Um, we have grain, black water recycling, composting toilet, you know, and all this crazy stuff. But it, it was... It was such a process because, you know, we weren't just um, hiring labor to do it. We did it all ourselves and we had to just pinch our pennies and, and make it happen. And when you're doing, you know, as you probably know, when you're doing like creative alternative infrastructure um, that's largely off grid, it just, it's, the upfront cost is a lot more than if you just tie it into city water or, you know, and whatnot. So it's been a heck of a process. And But we've paid for all of it with the food we grew in, in these fields, in these no-till fields. So it's it's pretty cool. I mean, we didn't take out bank loans. We didn't, um, you know, access a trust fund or anything like that. Like, we literally paid for it with beets and turnips, you know. Tell me a little bit about why you decided to do all the, the stuff the hard way. You know, when, I, when I'm when talking to beginning farmers, I often point out, you know, and, and I stole this from... I stole this from somebody else, so I don't I don't remember who, but I always say you know, you you can be a nudist or you can be a Buddhist, but you can't be a nudist Buddhist, you know? You can you can be and you're you're already like being weird by yeah. doing organic vegetable farming in the city and now you're gonna add this other right. layer of being no till and now you're gonna add another layer of being completely off the grid and water sure, independent. Sure. So why? Yeah, I mean I think we are I mean I'm the first person to say that we are just kind of masochistic and we we are psychotic in our in our environmentalism. You know, we know that we are just hardcore and I think we got into this, you know, I've been farming since I was twenty four and if you remember the way you were when you're twenty four, you're insanely ideal you have a ton of energy and you think you can change the world and I'm you know 34 now and I'm very jaded and I have two kids so I don't believe that anymore but I did get into this when I was young enough to just think that we could just do whatever we wanted to do and, and um, we didn't have to compromise anything and Dan was much of the same way and um you know, I don't know. Looking back, I don't think we would necessarily do anything differently, but we certainly recognize that this has almost killed us and that there's no balance to our lives. And we're juggling kids now and we feel definitely overwhelmed. And um, now our quest is not so much building this incredible, you know, off-grid farm in the city. Our quest is maintaining this farm somehow and finding some balance in our lives and finding time for our kids and, and just finding happiness. Because, you know, you just can't do that Wonder Woman kind of stuff and really, you know, at the end of the day, just like feel really great. <laughs> so... One thing I would say about the infrastructure piece is, is that when we got here, um, it was a blank slate. You know, it was, it was there was nothing here. Um, so when we thought about what we wanted to do with it and the types of things that we wanted to implement, we had, we would have to invest, it, no matter what, we're going to have to invest a lot of money into building a house or, you know, um, developing infrastructure of any sort. So to us, it just made sense. If we're, making, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's, let's make the investment. Um, um, and, and, you know, if it takes a longer amount of time, then it takes a longer amount of time. But we just need to, you know, we'll, we're never going to have enough money to, to put into this. We're, we just need to do it right the first time. Um, and so we just we just decided to stick to our guns with it and, and say, you know, we're, we're going to try to make the most environmentally, you know, stable infrastructure that we possibly can. So. Now, and and the, to add to that, I mean, one example of that is, you know, when you're dealing with raw land in the city, it was going to cost us about twenty thousand dollars to tie into city water. Um, so at that point, so that's that's a lot of money. So we designed our dream water system instead, that's off grid and chemical free and blah blah blah, and it costs, you know, just slightly more. Um, 
And, and then beyond that, you know, we, we are set up because we have now the farm is, you know, we're not all the way there. We have a barn to build. We have a greenhouse to build. We still have interior stuff on our home to finish, but we have no utility bills. Um, our land payments are extremely low every year. We basically have, you know, close to zero expenses on the farm. Um, they're very minimal. And then our living expenses are extremely minimal too, because we're, you know, hundred percent solar powered. We just, we don't have utility bills, you know? Um, so, so we're kind of, you know, and we're in our early thirties. So I hope that by the time we're like in our forties, we're just cruising and we can really, you know, decide, Hey, do I really even want to produce commercial vegetables this year? I don't really have to, I can just homestead if I want to, you know? So, um, you know, hopefully we'll be in a really good place eventually. And we'll at some point, you know, feel really good about, you know, we'll really see the fruits of our labor. Um, you know, like we touched on before, we have young kids. And I think anyone who has young kids understands what a stressful time that is. And it's hard to feel, you know, <laughs> relaxed and happy at that stage of life. But, but I think in about, you know, five, 10 years, we'll be, we'll be hopefully sitting pretty and, um, you know, enjoying life more. You guys are, it sounds like have three, maybe four different enterprises going on on the farm. You've got the, you've got the vegetable production, you've got the orchards, you've got the laying hens and you've got the compost. Is the, is the, the compost something you're actually doing for sale or is that an, in, or is that an internal project? Yeah, that was, you know, again, part of this, part of this piece where, you know, where here we are farming in the city, we want to be a resource to the community. And um, we just, you know, see how many resources are wasted, you know, how much food goes down the garbage disposal or gets thrown away and whatnot. Um, so because we're right here in the city, we thought, okay, you know, we're composting all our food waste, both from the farm and in our home. Um, why not compost the neighborhood's food waste? So we applied for a grant um, to fund the city wide composting program. So basically any area resident can drop their food scraps. We take meat, dairy, cooked raw, whatever, and they can drop some yard waste, uh, grass clippings and leaves. They can bring it to our parking lot during certain hours and then um, they dump it in a big dump trailer and we haul it to the back of the farm and compost it in windrows. And then we use that compost um, in our orchard. Um, it's unfortunately not clean enough. It's, there's a lot of weed seed in it and you know, we can't really control what's going into it. So um, we use it in the orchards. We don't put it on the vegetable fields right now. We just like to evolve our program so we can get it hot enough and kill all that stuff. But it's, you know, we've diverted tonnage of waste from the landfill. Um, we have a lot of happy people who compost and feel really good about what they're doing. Um, so it's a cool program. And I, you know, something that I, I always think, wow, wouldn't it be great if every neighborhood had an urban farm that was, you know, recycling people's waste and feeding them at the same time. So I'm curious about... How much compost are you guys actually producing in a year? Um, I mean, we accept, oh, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, uh, we, we should keep better track of, of what right. we're actually doing, but we don't manage the program as well as we should. We sh should, it's just hard, you know, we're, we're, running a farm every day. So the compost program kind of, you know, we just, we get the waste from the people and then um, mismanage it when it's on the farm and, you know, they don't see that. And that's great. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. But I mean, regardless of what happens to that waste, um, I mean, it, it does get composted. It breaks down and we use the compost. And, you know, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, it is diverting all that waste from the landfill. And so, you know, that's a good thing. So tell me about your process for that. Is you said you're hauling it to the back of the property. Do you guys have a tractor then that you're using to turn that? Or is, is this all being done on a hand scale? No, we, we do have equipment. We have a tractor for hauling the compost dumpster, for turning the compost with the front end loader. Um, and then we use our tractor. We don't, you know, obviously plow or till in the vegetable production, but we do, um, you know, we lay a lot of straw in a no-till production. So the tractor moves around big round bales for us. It moves our chicken trailers from place to place and we use it to mow. So, yeah, I mean, Dan's on equipment very little, I would say, you know, um, as well as he hates equipment, so as little as he can manage to be on it. Um, but but certainly equipment plays a part in our farm. Yeah, for sure. So tell me some about about your orchard then. What what kinds of crops do you guys have planted there, and and where are you at in the, I guess in the life cycle of of your orchard? Is it still a startup thing, or are you getting fruit off of it now? 
still young, uh, for sure. We are getting some fruit off of it. We planted our first apple trees um, in 2010. Um, I guess I'll run through the list of what we have. Um, we have apples, uh, maybe about 12 varieties, something like that. Um, a lot of them are antique varieties. Um, we have peaches. We have Asian pears. So a few plum and cherry trees that we weren't necessarily thinking were majorly for production, but uh, more for ourselves. But yeah, mainly the peaches and apples and Asian pears and European pears for actual production fruit. And then we have blueberry bushes. Uh, we have blackberries. We have um, strawberries. Um, we have perennial asparagus as well, which isn't, you know, a fruit tree or an orchard thing, but <laughs> I'll throw it in with the perennials. Um, but um, yeah, and, um, you know, all of those trees were planted between 2010 and I think our, you know, we've replaced some, but the major quantity that we uh, last planted was maybe in fall of 2012. Um, so they're all, you know, uh, a few seasons old. Um, the apple trees are on full-size rootstock, um, so they're not really bearing uh, a whole lot yet. They, they started to bear this year, um, but um, they still have a ways to go. Um, and the peach trees produced a, a crop this year. And, you know, um, it is it is a young orchard. And we, I worked on an apple, I, I worked on an apple orchard in Pennsylvania for two years before um, moving back to Kansas City and um, meeting Brooke and everything. We were on the, so yeah, I worked on that orchard for two years and um, kind of learned a little bit about the trade, but we're still very much figuring orcharding out. Um, we're intending to, um, you know, start spraying some holistic sprays. But at this point, juggling the vegetable production with the trees and everything has been difficult. So we're hoping that we can evolve that um, um, and and get um, a lot of marketable fruit. But at this point, um, you know, the peaches this year, we probably got, I would say, 30% of the total crop to market. Um, and the rest of it, you know, um, was not sellable for market. So that's unfortunate, you know, and we need to improve improve that and get more to market for sure. I that's think every that. organic farmer knows, you know, it, who has a few fruit trees, you know, how hard organic fruit production is, especially if you're in the Midwest with the disease and pest pressure we have here with the humidity. Um, so, yeah, it's a learning curve for sure. We're good at growing vegetables and we struggle to grow tree fruit. And it's really, it needs to be a full-time job for somebody. Um, and it's, you know, right now it's just impossible because veggies are bread and butter. That's what pays for our livelihood. So we'll figure it out. Um, but our our strawberries, however, are a huge crop for us. You know, they produce about 10000 a year for us. And blackberries are becoming really lucrative too. So berries are great. They're a lot of labor to pick. Um, but hopefully they'll kind of carry us through with the fruit until our orchards really start producing. Well, and of course, anything that you want to make a lot of money off of is usually going to be expensive to grow somewhere along the line, whether it's in the production or whether it's in the harvest. So I do think it's one of the the hard things to balance when you're dealing with perennial crops is that there's almost always a long investment period before you get the payback. Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. we remind ourselves of that because we put a lot of money into the orchards as far as, I mean, just the nursery stock, but um, we we very recently purchased, you know, like a $6,000 spray tank and all these holistic ingredients to spray with. And, you know, we spent close to $10,000 and so we need to see that come back at some point. <laughs> you know? it's, uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed um, that, you know, actually spraying the trees every couple of weeks and following sort of a Michael Phillips kind of uh, regime with his spraying. Um, I, yeah, I hope that, I hope that works. And I hope in a few years we really see the fruits of that. So so let's dig in a little bit more about your no-till vegetable production, because this is really interesting to me, especially being okay. further up north. I think it, it starts to get a lot harder to do the no-till. But I've, I've run into a couple of people that are doing the same kind of thing that you're doing with laying down lots of straw, pulling it aside, really kind of relying on the, the earthworms and the microbes to do right. the tillage for you. So... Can you can you walk us through how you might go? Let's let's pick a crop and just walk us through how the production might work on that. 
in a no-till system? One of the really interesting sort of methods we use um, is for cucurbits like summer squash or winter squash. But basically, you know, you'll have a field that is covered in straw. Um, always the season before, um, or I should say the winter before, we are running our chickens hard on all of our vegetable fields as they come out of production. So the chickens do, honestly, about 90% of the work for us. So they run hard on a field as it comes out of production. They poop everywhere. They scratch up weeds. They eat eat pests that are left over, um, they pretty much, you know, they break down all the straw that's on there too. So they're, you know, they're just like creating so much organic matter and creating sort of a clean slate for us. Obviously, we have to go in and dig out dandelions and some perennial stuff, but then we usually remulch depending on what crop is going in there. And so for cucurbits, for instance, you know, you waltz into this field that's covered with straw, you might clean it up a little bit, but then we mark out um, the beds and we open up kind of, I don't know, holes that are probably about a foot in um, diameter. And then we take com- buckets of compost um, and we just dump like a mound, um, maybe one, I don't know, half a five-gallon bucket, depending winter squash or summer squash. And we do this in a real like systematic, you know, kind of factory fashion moving down the line. And then we pat down the compost and um, we plant the seeds right in the compost mound and cover it with row cover. There's no irrigation in our no-till system whatsoever. And yeah, so they sprout under the row cover and do their thing and the straw suppresses weeds and they've got their little mini mounds, you know, that they're growing in and things do, you know, things do really well um, usually. So um, it's pretty cool. And you, you can talk about dry seeded. Yeah. Um, so for direct seeded stuff, you know, basically the the situation that Brooke described, where we, we have a field that has been kind of worked down by chickens and stuff, and then we'll relay straw and everything. And uh, for direct seeding stuff, um, we'll probably lay the straw a little bit thinner um, because what we'll ultimately end up doing um, is pulling back the uh, pulling back, exposing a four foot bed, exposing an area that that can you know then be furrowed and seeded, and so. We'll expose the entire bed four foot width, and then and then take a. We we like to use the, um, just a, a hoe that's a kind of a skinny hoe, and and drag that down the row and make a furrow with with a hoe kind of on its side, and then um, we'll make a furrow and, and direct feed into that, and then you have the aisle aisleway nicely mulched because you pulled the back all that straw, um, and it's thicker than in the aisle and, and and exposed in the bed, and then you weed hand weed in there, and yeah, we'll add comp. Post. Well, when we seed the, the crop, we'll actually, instead of bending down and, and covering things back up with the, the dirt that we've kicked up, um, we'll put down land compost on top of the, seed, the little seeds. And then that helps with the germination and everything and, and gives them some, some fertility to work with um, in addition to what's already there. I mean, that's, that's kind of how it goes. And, you know, if we try to keep things well weeded throughout the season, but if things get weedy at the end of it, then the chickens will work. Uh, there's a nice rooster crow. Um, <laughs> and the chickens will work it down again. <laughs> so when you're doing a direct seeded crop, then you said you pull the mulch off the bed. Are you remulching those direct seeded crops or does does the mulch stay off for the rest of the season? So the mulch then stays off. So the mulch is removed from that four foot wide bed um, for the season. And, and it's just piled heavy in the aisles, which is nice. It presses weeds and just makes, you know, like a nice area to walk down and harvest and deal with. So, so but just by virtue of the soil next Ever having been killed, um, we don't need to irrigate. So even though those beds are totally exposed, because the soil structure is intact, uh, you know, it just it retains moisture so much better. Um, it also drains better too. And you know, I, if our soil is not good. I might give the impression that it is. Um, like one of our fields is a former baseball diamond. You know, we have heavy excavated clay. And even though we've often, you know, we often bitch about how incredibly labor intensive no-till is, I don't. I think we could we could have, you know, plowed the fields we're growing in. I think it just would have been a really you know, it just would have been a mess and we would not have grown successfully in them. So this system really allows us to grow in pretty poor soil. And, you know, this year, for instance, I mean, we grow a lot in a small space. We were able to make, oh, probably about $45,000 off, you know, a half an acre, you know, in production so, of veggies. So, I mean, it, it when it works, it really works. And and even with that 45000 and half an acre, you know, our crops, they did nominally this year. I mean, they didn't 
really thrive. So, you know, I can't imagine what it would have been if they had been, you know, just awesome. But it is a cool system. It's it's so different. It's so foreign. Um, it's so scary when you first start because you think, how can I just like put this plant in this hard ground or put this seed in this, you know, compacted earth that's never been worked by? It just, it seems bizarre. Um, and then, and then yet it just, you know, things thrive. So um, we've largely, we don't read anything. So we don't have time. We don't go to workshops or talks. We're just like, you know, we're kind of these curmudgeons out here. Um, so we've largely created our own systems. Um, I don't know what other notes farmers are doing. I don't know if there are other no-till farmers. You know, I have, I have no idea what other people do, but you know, we, we have this system that works for us. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm starting to think maybe there's something to it. You know, maybe other people ought to know about it. We do treat every every crop differently. You know, it, it's not like, like all direct seeded crops we, we treat exactly the same way. Usually that, you know, what I described to you is, is what we do. Like some things, like if we're putting in onions, um, we'll often clear off the bed to plant and make those furrows and things like that. And then we'll come back in and mulch because they sit in the ground for such a long period of time and compete poorly with weeds and things like that. You know, so it just depends on the situation, really. And you must be going through a whole lot of straw. I'd say when we were in, we scaled back our production a lot this year because we have no apprentices and we had a new baby. So when we're in full production, which is about in vegetables alone, uh, well, we use a lot of straw in the perennials too. So uh, there was a point in time where we were using close to, you know, 70 bales in a year, 70 big round bales, 70 to 80. And that was including, you know, mm, an acre and a half to two acres in veggies and then um, a lot of different perennial projects. So, yeah, we go through a lot when when we're, you know, in full production. But it's relatively the cost compared to what we make. You know, it's like maybe the straw costs us $3,000 for the season, but you're also making close to 100000 You know, so it's just, I mean, it's its a, just a, really a small farm cost. So where are you getting your straw? So we've got a couple of different growers that we work with. There's, you know, there's a lot of wheat farms around uh, around Missouri and Kansas, a uh, common crop. We have one guy that's certified organic that we get it from, and he doesn't always have enough for for what we want. You know, initially, we were, when we were trying to kill the, the plots, we would get like 80 round bales um, at a time, and that would uh, mulch out and kill like an acre, acre and a half of space if we had just like bare ground grass. Now, now that we're renewing those plots and everything, it's actually much, much less straw than that. Easily, um, you know, a third of that probably. A certified organic guy doesn't always have uh, what we want. We had we had a really rainy season last year, and he didn't have any straw for us. And then there's a conventional grower that we have gotten straw from, and he, you know, straw is tricky um, because it can have like a lot, a lot of wheat seed in it. It can have wheat seeds. It can have a lot of different issues. So you know, you, you have to be careful about what sort you're getting it from and we found a conventional grower who um, has really good quality straw um, he keeps the wheat seed get the wheat seed out but there there is some wheat seeds that we can deal with um, but um, but the wheat seed you know if, if you have a field of straw that's laid out there and there's a ton of wheat in it then you can end up with a nice cover crop of wheat <laughs> of- right which isn't necessarily what you want when you're trying to grow cucurbits yeah yeah, I lost a I lost a garlic crop that way one time. It wasn't pleasant. I, and I think that's you know um, has to do with um, the growers' practices and like what kind of equipment they use, how they rake it, and everything else. And and you know you can have some variability in that. So you might have a couple failures and then find somebody that that you like and you can work with. So that's where we come with it. And then you you know you, then you have to ask questions about pesticide, herbicide, and what they're using, and you know um, try to get honest answers about that. And trust trust what's going on with, with all that. Yeah, hopefully you can trust your suppliers with that. When you're actually getting that straw then out in the field, so you've got that round bale, it's sitting at the edge of your property. How are you getting that onto the soil? 
That was one thing that, that we found we did need the tractor for was just physically moving those bales around, moving the ground bales around that are, that might be, you know, as much as 1,200 pounds, you know, just, just getting them from place to place. Now, Brooke and I um, are quite a team, so we, we have actually um, rolled those up onto trailers and, you know, hauled them behind a truck and then rolled them back out onto a field and everything. But, yeah, that's how we get them to the field. Then we have to break them down from there and actually take our armful of straw and lay it out and all of that. So it's very labor intensive for sure. I mean, in a perfect world, you try to do a lot of straw laying over the winter on nicer days, you know, just scheduling time to prep the field so that you're not inundated with everything in spring. Um, and this winter, if I was going to have a baby in April, I had a baby at the end of April, I made sure that in my pregnant state this winter, I laid and prepped all the field so that we could really just walk in and plant um, when it came time. So, and that was, that was awesome. That made our life so much easier. I mean, that's the reason we actually had crops. You know, they actually got in the ground because we saved so much time and labor with laying straw in the winter. And also one thing I will say about the, the no-till system, I often hear normal farmers that till <laughs> um, say that they uh, can't get in the field, you know, in the spring. They, they, they're they trying to plow, you know, they don't want to, uh, they're trying to um, plow at the right time or, or, or till at the right time and not till when it's too wet. They can't get in and it's too wet. And they're waiting for it to dry out and the weather conditions aren't right. Well, you know, if we have everything laid out like that, then we can go in whenever we want and plant. We're never hindered by, you know, the amount of moisture since we're not tilling in that way, so. There's really just never been a time where we could not get in the field. I mean, we have been, you know, it, it may have rained like six inches the night before or something, and we're able to get in the field and plant the next day. I mean, it's it's awesome. Or there could be snow on the ground, and sometimes we're able to get in and put transplants in or something. But it's great to not be sort of held up by that. Are there crops that you guys don't grow because you're doing this no-till system? There are absolutely crops we don't grow but not necessarily because of no-till. I'm trying to think if there's anything that we don't grow specifically because of no-till, and that would be um, no. Oh, uh, I think I think that that um, peas. Uh, for some reason, peas don't like no-till. There's there's certain crops that that don't seem to like it as much, um, but most crops do pretty well with it. I would say, you know, really the, the only things we don't grow um, is more because we are very stubborn and we refuse to spray anything, including, you know, certified organic pesticides um, like BT. So we stopped growing heading brassicas like broccoli and cauliflower, things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, mostly because they do take up a lot of space for one and we have a pretty small production, but also we just didn't want to be spraying anything that might kill beneficials. So um, we do grow a lot of brassicas, but just not those ones in particular. And yeah, um, that's that's really more the issue that we won't grow something because maybe it'll force us to use a practice that we're not 100% happy with. And I assume then you guys aren't using any black plastic on the farm either? No, no. Nope. And do you have high tunnels in production? So we are just like we're so anti-plastic every farmer we know is in love with high tunnels and love season extension they're building them left and right like frankly a lot of the farmers around here do not know how to grow in the field they only know how to grow in a tunnel um they've just gotten so spoiled by that controlled environment and we're the opposite we love growing in the field we want to use as little plastic out here as possible um so Dan worked on a farm at one point that had about six tunnels in production and you know he just hated it, just always trying to manage the tunnels and, and roll up the plastic on a hot day and running back and forth. And, um, you know, it, yeah, they were able to produce through the winter to a degree, but um, he found that it was a lot more time and energy than actual income. Um, and that, you know, it, it for us, we prefer to grow storage crop and kind of clear the fields in late November and just have veggies stored in the cooler all through the winter. Um, we feel like we have just as much food, if not more, you know, than if we were growing in tunnels. Yeah, and one thing I would add to that is, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of northeastern growers that are very much justified in growing in a tunnel because the season is just simply a lot shorter. Um, but, you know, here in Missouri, you know, it's a pretty long season. We're, we're still pulling stuff out of the field. We're, we will 
and continue to pull stuff out of the field probably in late November and early December. Sometimes we have to pull it a little bit earlier than that. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're still producing out here. We'll have storage crops, you know, through most of the winter. And but and then we'll we'll start having spinach and asparagus in, in April. So it's, it's just, it's a long growing season. And I don't think it's totally necessary to have a tunnel, you know. So what other kinds of things, I mean, you said you're not doing sprays for pest control. You mentioned that you're doing row cover for your cucurbits. Yeah, we like we like our row cover. We like physically keeping the pests off. Um, honestly, as cheap, well as I feel like it, it is kind of uh, sounds idealistic, and I think at one point it was, but we really do a ton of companion cropping, and we have a ton of beneficial plants out here, beneficial flowers, beneficial herbs, and we, you know, at first when I started this this quest to plant beneficials, I felt like okay, this is a bunch of BS. Like they look pretty, but I'm not controlling my pest pressure this way. You know, I just have this cool stuff planted. And now, you know, 10 years later, I feel like it is it totally pays off out here. Um, I, I feel like our pest pressure is reduced quite a bit from the amount of beneficial stuff we have out here. I mean, we have just an insane amount of beneficial insects and we see them working in the field. Um, and sure, we get a lot of pests and there are certain seasons where pests on particular crops are horrible, but we always seem to pull through and still get a decent crop um, off most things. So, yeah, we don't really see a need for spring in the veggies and I feel like each year our soil gets better each year our systems um, just they just start working for us better and so hopefully you know that that trend will just continue and things will get get better and better out here now you're obviously bringing in a lot of organic matter you mentioned the your soil getting better are you also supplementing that with minerals and and other other fertilizers no, we just, we love, like, you know, this idea of just physically running the chickens on the beds. That's all of our fertility. So, you know, they run on a plot. Um, and, well, we are bringing in lots of compost, I would say, too. You know, you've got, you've got the straw providing organic matter. Um, then we use a lot of compost within the vegetable production. And then we use the chickens. So, um, we, you know, they... They definitely fertilize the field uh, a lot, and then we always clean out their house on that particular area that they're on. So, and we spread more manure that way. Um, and between, you know, yeah, between the compost and the birds, it seems to be, you know, more than enough. Um, we haven't had to do any special amendments yet. We do lime maybe once every. We've limed once out here. We've been, oh, we've been here for six years, um, you know, entering our seventh season. So um, eventually we'll probably have to adjust the pH again. But yeah, we haven't, we haven't added a lot of minerals to date. Um, and they say, I don't know who they is exactly, but they do say that in a no-till system, um, things kind of balance out. So you don't have to add as much stuff as you might in a more work-killed sort of situation. And, and we've talked a lot about production. Where do you guys take your produce to sell it? Um, so uh, we we used to have our own farmers market that we run. That was that that's like the fifth business that we <laughs> that we run, right? Um, but um, the, but we used to have our own farmers market that we would run. Uh, it was a Friday night market, and Brooke started it her very first season growing, and it was very successful. It was an indoor market. It was called Bad Seed, um, and we were known as the Bad Seeds. And then um, we closed that down um, last February when we were preparing to have a new child um, and figured that we couldn't any longer juggle all this stuff that we're doing and had to pare down somewhere. So we cut our vegetable production in half. We closed that business and um, now we're selling at a organic farmer's market here in, in Kansas City. It's called the Brookside Farmer's Market. And we sell um, really well, probably like 90% of what we grow at the farmer's market and the other 10% We'll get get rid of on CSA and um, which is you know we do our CSA on trade. It's all trade, <laughs> you know services that we're trading. Um, we traded for midwife um, for our new child, and um, then we also do some restaurant sales and things like that. With that, I think it's a good time for us to stop, take a break. When we come back, I want to talk to you guys a little bit more about how you're managing your labor in this in what sounds like a very labor intensive operation. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. So we'll be back after we get a word from our sponsors. Just a couple minutes with with I'm going to get it right here 
Brooke Savaggio, and Daniel Harrier. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light body mixes for certified organic transplant production. And while it may seem early to be thinking about next year's greenhouse season, you don't want to miss participating in Vermont Compost Company's fall pre-buy program. When you order Vermont Compost Potting Soil for next year's growing season, you can save significantly on the finest potting soil that I personally have ever used. There are many great options for significant savings. Vermont Compost Company organizes shared truckload weeks where they organize and group orders by state or region. When you place your order to ship on one of these shared truckloads, they offer discounts on the purchase of your potting soil. Plus, they consolidate the orders so growers also save on shipping fees. If you want to get the best possible deal on Vermont compost potting soil, order a full truckload. This is what we used to do on my farm. If you don't need a full truckload yourself, get together with your farming friends and neighbors and order a full truckload together. This option offers the best possible price per sling bag or pallet and the best possible shipping rate. It's also the best option for growers who are a great distance away from Vermont. Growers who pre-buy full truckloads often end up paying a price for their sling bags that is lower than what growers pay for a sling bag picked up in Vermont. The fall pre-buy program runs September 21st through December 21st. For more information, visit the website, vermontcompost.com. Bandwidth for the show is provided by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but it is truly a superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability every farm needs. I've worked with BCS tractors for over 24 years, and I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I'm not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheel tractor. And these really are small tractors with the kinds of features found on their four-wheel cousins and a wide array of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, and more. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and some really cool videos of BCS in action. bcsamerica.com. All right, and we're back with Brooke Savaggio and Daniel Hurrier. You know, you guys have, have described a system that sounds extremely labor intensive. Everything from, you know, getting the mulch out on the ground, you know, pulling the mulch off the ground, trying to manage these other aspects of the farm, the chickens, the orchards. What are you guys doing for labor besides yourselves, of course? So, right, right. Yeah, we're killing ourselves. That's number one. <laughs> we're in the field a lot. But what we've done from the get-go, and, and I will say this is the first season that we've moved away from from um, this labor system, but we were hosting a pretty full-on apprenticeship. Um, we had close to about, depending on the season, you know, 75 to 90 hours of labor out here a week. And it was all in trade. It was not paid labor. Some of it might have involved stipends, but most of it was trade. Um, so that was, you know, obviously huge for us when we were building our farm and needed to squirrel away, squirrel away every penny. We couldn't really pay people hourly. Um, but our apprenticeship program, um, at one point we would have about four bodies in the field. Um, you know, the way we did it was, um, Dan mentioned the bad seed market that we used to run. Well, that was a brick and mortar building and it also served as our apprentice housing. So we had two bedrooms down there. We housed two apprentices there. And because we couldn't pay them, um, this was even pre-stipend days, we would, we would, uh, they would work on the farm 30 hours a week in exchange for housing and vegetables. Um, and because it was 30 hours, we'd sort of scrunch it into four days a week. So they had three days off to have a part-time job. And that worked out because Bad Seed was, you know, in the heart of downtown. There's a million bars, restaurants, um, just a ton of retail businesses. You know, they could find a job, walk to work work and uh, work on the farm on the other days. So, you know, it was nice for a lot of people who were not looking for that middle of nowhere farm experience. Like they still wanted to live in a sort of hip urban neighborhood and be young, but also get this this experience on a farm. And then in addition to that, we would do something called a volunteer apprentice, the apprenticeship, which was 15 hours a week in exchange for food and education. And back in those days, we used to host, you know, formal workshops one to two times a month and really kind of push the education piece since we weren't providing, you know, actual pay. And yeah, that, that got us a lot of help out here. Um, and we did that for 
pretty much a, a system similar to that for the first five years. And now in our sixth year, we closed the bad seed, lost our um, apprentice housing and, you know, had a baby. <laughs> so we had to sort of just be apprentice free this year. And this is the first time Dan and I have tackled our production by ourselves with a baby literally in tow, you know, strapped to our back. Um, and it is amazingly somehow worked out, but that's largely because, you know, our systems just have gotten so much better and more streamlined every year. Um, what would have taken us, you know, there in first year no-till, I mean, oh my God, like working with this soil that is rock hard, you can't even run, you know, you can't even make a furrow with a tool. I mean, the tool will not like even go into the soil. So, you know, over time of building our soil and learning our systems, we're just able to do do things, you know, in some cases, 20 times faster than before. So, yeah, uh, then the evolution is that we will get some sort of apprentice housing figured out this winter so that next year we do not have to do this apprentice-free thing with a baby um, and kind of just build the apprenticeship back up again. And, I mean, the, the goal of, of, of adding labor again to the farm and adding an apprenticeship again to the farm would be that I can, you know, one at least one of us can spend uh, a substantial uh, amount more time in the orchard and, and focusing on that so that I can apply the sprays that need to be uh, applied to the orchard during the appropriate times, you know, and, you know, still have, probably have to split my time with the vegetable production to some extent, but at least be freed up a little bit. And then also obviously uh, free us up for time with our family and everything. But yeah, I mean, the, the apprenticeship program has been a great source of, of labor for us. But, I, you know, I, I, it does sound like we have just an immense amount of labor out here, and we do, but at the same, you know, I mean, as far as the amount of work that we have to put into this, um, but at the same time, I do think there are a lot of efficiencies that we've seen. Um, with no-till production, um, you know, it, it, I think that there are areas where we where we save time compared to tilled farms. Even though that there are other things that no that tilled farms do that are morally efficient, you know, it just depends on on which aspects of the farm you're looking at. So when you talk about that, when you talk about uh, saving labor relative to what a, a more conventional operation, even a more conventional organic operation, might do, can you give me some examples of that? Well, I certainly feel like, and, and maybe this is arguable, um, but we are certainly saving time on weeding um, by having the mulch in place. Now, then again, I've seen a lot of farms that operate without intensive weeding, like they kind of just have weedy fields. But, you know, our, our fields stay weeded a lot better because of the mulch, and we're in there a little bit less. It's probably the most obvious one. I, you know, I, I sometimes I feel like because we're a hand-powered system, um, we are just forced to keep things really tight and really manage things incredibly well because we're also on a smaller scale. Um, I think just even within that mindset, there's less inefficiencies out here. I, I sometimes see other farmers and their employees kind of just like... I don't know. Sometimes it seems like just busy work or doing something a little bit aimlessly that's not really like getting to the core of what needs to be done. I feel like we're extremely focused with our time and with the time of our laborers out here and um, really just understand what needs to be prioritized. Um, and, you know, and that's that's probably 90 percent of it, you know. Um, and then one thing that that is definitely a labor saver for us are the chickens. I mean, I cannot tell you they are they are our best farm workers. We could not do the no till system without them. So they're they're a big part of that. You know, it's not just human bodies. It's the feathered ones too <laughs> that are saving a lot of time for us and doing a lot of good. So tell me a little bit more about how you're actually managing the chickens. You mentioned that you guys have some trailers. Um, and and then when we were on break, I heard you mention something about the electro net and trying to keep grandma and the baby away from that. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so we have two flocks of chickens at any given time. The flocks are roughly about 100 birds. And um, they... They are. They live in trailers, you know, movable trailers. Um, the trailers are fairly small. You know, it's just meant to house the birds at night because they're on pasture all day. And so we use electro netting and 
we we basically just move the chickens around the farm during the off season. Obviously, they're in the vegetable fields. The, the vegetable fields just as they come out of production. Like for instance, they just prepped where we're planting garlic. We've gotten them off there. Now they're um, in another field prepping for spring crops. But the two flocks move to different areas, and they're generally in about oh a sixth of an acre area. Um, sometimes we'll do it smaller and kind of pulse graze them and move them more often, but they'll work the area down. Sometimes they're there for two to four weeks, depending on what the situation is. And, um, and like I said before, every time before they move, we clean out their house onto that area and spread all the manure from the house. And, and it's great, you know, with the Electronet, we're able to move them around pretty quickly and efficiently um, and keep predators out and keep them in um, as long as the tractor's running. <laughs> The trailers are fairly easy to move, you know, but it, it's certainly a juggle. It's another element too, because you have to, you have to obviously time things. Sometimes it's too wet to move the birds or, you know, weather gets in the way. And um, it, it is one more element to always be thinking about, like, how are we working the birds right now? During the on season, um, the birds are usually fertilizing the orchards. They're in the peach orchards in the spring. Then they move to the apples. Um, sometimes they're just in large, you know, pasture areas. But for the most part, they're always aiding some crop. And then are you guys harvesting and selling the eggs, I assume? Yeah, yeah. eggs are a huge, a huge thing for us. So in the spring, we have about 80 dozen eggs a week. Um, and then obviously that starts to tittle out as the season goes on. But we have eggs every week, and that's a huge draw for customers. I feel like there's a lot of people who come just for the eggs, and then they might buy a few vegetables because of that. So I happen to know, because we did eggs on my farm, what a complete pain it is to try to wash those and get them ready ready for market and meet those those standards that customers have. What's your process for doing that? It, it really worked out nicely when we had apprentices because they would get trained to chicken care. So they would feed and water the chickens in the morning, which is a fairly, you know, it takes about an hour when you've got two big flocks. Um, and then at scheduled times throughout the day, they will collect the eggs. And then at the end of the day, you know, they're watering the chickens again, making sure everybody's okay, collecting the eggs for the final time. And then they're cleaning them and packaging them and putting them in the cooler. So, you know, when apprentices are here, it's awesome. We don't even have to think about it. Um, this year, was, you know, we didn't have apprentices, so we've been doing chicken duties every day, and that has been, you know, it, it's crazy. It's, it's hard to, like, pull yourself from the field, stop what you're doing, and go collect eggs before they eat them all, and and then at the end of the day, when you're so tired, just clean them, and often what would happen would we'd, we would have buckets of eggs pile up, you know, and then we'd be cleaning, like, sitting down at midnight on a Saturday, like, cleaning, you know, 80 dozen eggs or something. We don't, we don't want to be in that position again next year. Um, but as long as there's apprentice labor, it really, you know, it, it works out nicely. And we just schedule that into their time. And I'm just curious, what kind of price are you getting for your eggs? $6 a dozen. Wow. Right. They're fed certified organic grain. Um, other farms doing the same things are now um, asking more. A another farm at our market is going to charge seven next year. We, you know, I would like to charge seven. It's not like the birds after the cost of grain, you know, the eggs don't make a ton of money. Um, but we also, we really want to keep our food affordable for people. So we, we really strive to keep our prices as low as we can. Um, and just, we more have the approach, okay, we need to make our systems more efficient so that, you know, we can keep our prices low. Um, but the birds, you know, we look at the eggs as a perk. I mean, they are really here to enhance our vegetable production and enhance the farm. So, you know, yeah, the eggs, the eggs in so many ways are just a bonus. Do you guys have predator problems? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, not, I don't think that we have as intense predator, uh, of predator problems as some of the rural farms do, um, but we definitely have owls. We definitely have hawks trying to prey on the chickens. And, um, you know, I, we definitely would have, uh, we, we definitely have raccoons that, that would attempt to prey on them and, and possums and things, but not too many foxes. We have had fox issues in the past, um, but the electronetting keeps anything you know, that's on the ground pretty much at bay. Um, it, our main concern with predators is, is definitely the owls and the hawks. What are you guys doing about those? 
if anything? It's not as big an issue with the full grown chickens. Um, the, the, when the hens get get larger, um, um, the owls, I don't know, I, they, they go in at night. They don't tend to attack them um, too heavily. Uh, if they have, they have plenty of other food, it's probably easier to get around as far as rabbits and mice and things like that. Um, but, um, but yeah, so the, the full grown hens, it's not as big of a problem. Um, when they're small, um, then we'll, they'll be, be preyed upon by, by owls and hawks. Um, and our solution to that, um, you know, which we figured out last year, really, is to have a goose in with them, and the goose it really acts as a good protector um, against against the owls and hawks. It's full grown goose, full grown goose, and um, and he keeps them at bay pretty well. We still have had some predation on them. Just you know, we we have a new flock out right now um, that has had some predation issues um, over the past couple of weeks, but I'm sure that there would be much more if we didn't have the goose. <laughs> like that, the goose. I, yeah, I had I've never great. I've never heard of that before. That's we used to keep a donkey with our sheep, but I like the idea right. of keeping a goose with your chickens. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it was by accident, you know. We used to have geese on the pond um, and ducks as well, and all of them got eaten by foxes, and there was one left, so we just threw him in with the chickens. And he's been traveling with the chickens for like God, it's been maybe four years now. And so, yeah, by accident, we figured out he was an excellent guard animal, and um, yeah, he's the reason. We, that we don't get near as many hawk attacks and things like that, and even the owls at night too. So yeah, the goose is awesome. He attacks us too, so you have to put up with a lot of you know torture every day from this obnoxious goose, but it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a year ago, last fall, when we put a uh, young flock out, um, we had had the the goose in with the older flock of birds, and the younger flock just went out, and we were having owl issues very badly on them just that particular fall, and so we were like, well, let's try. The goose in there, and it stopped immediately, um, and and so that was great. Um, and you know, this like I said, this fall we've had a little bit, but it's certainly managed by the goose. Now, you mentioned that you guys buy certified organic feed for your chickens. Are you guys a certified organic farm? So we are not, um, and that's a good question. A lot of people ask us about that. But we we basically on our farm follow certified organic practices and in in many ways go above and beyond. Um, the reason we are not certified organic kind of started out as more us being sort of rebellious and pissed off at the system. It was like it was mainly to those things like, look, I farm in this incredibly holistic way, and it is so much above and beyond organic standards that you know to call to to be certified organic would actually undermine the way I'm doing things. So there was that, you know, greater than thou self-righteous thing going on for a little while. And we've grown out of that. And now more the reason we're not certified is um, really just due to practicality. I mean, you know, it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of time. We've been farming for 10 years now. We're a very popular farm in the Kansas City area. We've built up a really dedicated customer base. Many of them have been to our farm. We're ex- extremely accessible. Um, people know us really well. They know the way we grow. And so it's not really necessary for us to be certified in order to move our product. That said, however, we would like to eventually get certified um, just more now to have all of our T's crossed. Um, we sell at a big market downtown next to a lot of wholesalers and conventional growers who are either you know buying produce or growing it and spraying the heck out of it. And if anyone walked up to them and said, um, do you spray or are you organic? They'd say, you know, no, I don't spray. Of course, this is, is organic. And, um, you you know, they come up and ask us the same thing. And I'm saying, no, I don't spray. Yes, this is organic. And without that, you know, that certified organic stamp of approval there, I feel like what makes me really that different from those guys who, you know, I, I feel like it is as a consumer, it's really nice to know that the farm you're buying from has that certification. So um, once, you know, we are a little more set up here, we will actually go through that process. Yeah, and I would say it's mostly logistical, you know, like like we don't have a barn right now, so, you know, like weighing out the produce to get the amounts that we're harvesting and then and then selling and everything and, and keeping track of all that paperwork um, when we're just barely making it in this, like, house that is kind of sort of set up um, on our farm. And, you know, we just need more to be more set up, more, um, you know, have more infrastructure, have the logistical bells and whistles 
whistles that we would need to to complete the processes that you know took better organic demands. Okay, so you're talking about needing better spaces to be able to do the the kinds of record keeping and the kinds of even just handling that you feel like would would make things work for a certified organic operation. But you also said that you you've put a lot of effort into the infrastructure that you've got. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what you've done with the infrastructure that you have. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, for the first four years that we were here, we didn't have water or electricity. Um, and so, you know, we just worked with what we had and we rented a house on the street and that's where we had like like a, a water hookup where we could, we wanted to water in transplants. We could fill a tank up and bring it on the farm and, you know, and water in transplants. Or if we um, needed to wash vegetables, you know, we had hoses there. We can, we can wash things off and everything and set that up there. Um, but like actually, lawn farm we did not have water or electricity for a long time <laughs> and we didn't um, have it for five five growing seasons this is yeah. the first that we've had it so it's pretty exciting so, you know, we have set up now, we have an earth contact uh, past solar house on the farm um, that that I spent four winters building, um, and it's still being built. I mean, we, we are living in there now, but we, we still have a lot of work to do in there. And alongside that, um, we wanted to, um, the local utility here in Kansas City had a great rebate program for solar, um, and uh, we wanted to get uh, hooked up to solar while the rebate program was going on in effect um, so that we could get it for as as, as, as cheaply as possible. Um, and so we took advantage of that and we, we have a 10 kilowatt solar uh, system on the farm that powers the whole farm and produces about four times the amount of energy that we use currently. Eventually when we add more coolers and things like that, that might not be the case. But, um, but right now it's like four times as much as we use. And so that solar system is actually set up like a shed. Um, it's, it's up on um, on metal poles and everything, and and uh, the back side of it is about uh, nine feet off the ground. And I think the, the front side is about six or seven, and um, and so we can actually stand underneath this solar roof, um, and we can wash vegetables under there and things like that, and have some shade and protection from the environment. Along with our house and that solar setup, um, we put in an off-grid water system, uh, pump water from a quarter-acre pond. Um, that's in um, a low corner of our pond or low corner of our farm and um, catches a lot of rainwater, holds about um, half a million gallons of water, and we pump that. We, we use a tiny fraction of, of what's in the pond for our potable water use. And since we don't irrigate, you know, um, between that and our potable water use and, and washing vegetables and things like that, that's enough. Uh, we actually water our livestock off of recycled water. So any water that comes out of the house gets um, recycled. Um, any urine um, and and any gray water from the laundry or from washing dishes and things like that that comes out of the house will then get filtered um, through a sand filter and through UV filtration sand it, and then that water can be used to water livestock and water plants and things. Or water in transplants and, you know, for the various uses on the farm. So I actually want to I want to stop there and just ask a question about the pond, because you mentioned getting potable water out of the pond. And normally surface water isn't considered to be potable. What are you what are you doing to treat that? So the the pond water, um, it, it's pumped from the pond, and when it, you know, the line that comes out of the pond then um, goes into a slow sand filter, which is like totally as old school as it gets for filtering water. <laughs> it's just it's just like a container filled with sand, um, and our container happens to be a concrete cube, essentially. It's like a septic tank or something like that. You know, it's filled with four feet of sand and some gravel to help with the drainage and everything. Um, but um, that drains through the sand filter and then that fills up a cistern. Um, I think it's maybe a 1500 gallon cistern. And then we can draw water off of that. Um, and that goes through, it goes into a pressure tank and through um, a UV filter to kill. I mean, the, the sand filter ought to get out any, like 99% of um, any 
harmful bacteria or cysts or anything like that. But the because we're using it to wash vegetables and stuff, we felt like the UV filter was an added, you know, safety precaution to sanitize the water. And so that goes through UV, and then and then from there it comes into the house and to the solar shed where we wash vegetables and things like that. So yeah, that's. I mean, I'd I'd like to add that I mean this is an engineered system that was approved by the city. So it, it definitely was quite a process. Um, finding someone capable of designing this, you know, chemical free water system. And uh, it was definitely a stretch working with the city to approve something so, you know, alternative. And we spent a lot of time figuring out the water system and then Dan spent an insane amount of time building it. I mean, it's it's an intense system. So, yeah, it, it, it definitely has come with, uh, I don't know, a lot. There, there was a lot of stress attached to it, but now it does function and it's awesome to see that water come from the pond, we drink it, we use it, and then it gets recycled and we use it again. You know, it's just, it's so cool. Thanks for taking the time to explain that. I just think that, you know, when I hear potable water from a pond, it pushes all of my food safety buttons. So was there other other infrastructure that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, we, we threw a walk-in cooler into a shipping container, a um, 20-foot long shipping container, um, inflated it and, and, and built that out with a cool bot and everything. Um, but um, like right now, we're trying to get underway the construction of a barn that the ground level will be built out of shipping containers and Firmed into a hill so that the, the ones that are actually, there'll be there'll be six chicken chicken containers that are actually buried into the hill and they will be super insulated. So when we use those for walking coolers, they'll be extremely efficient and then it'll have a, a loft on it as well that's more actually wood framed. And we're going to use that. And th- once we have that piece of infrastructure in place with the loft and everything, then, then we'll be able to actually think about possibly certifying organic and, and having those, you know, just the space and the setup to make an efficient record keeping system and, and, and doing the things that we need to do to, to take that under. With that, I think that would be a good time for us to turn to our lightning round. Cool. And I'm going to start with, with you, Daniel. What's your favorite tool on the farm? Well, Brooke mentioned my hands, and I thought that was a good answer. But but I, I maybe more than my, my hands even, I really like this little tiny hoe that we have. It's like it's like a very small hoe. It's, um, and it's, it's made by Rogue. Um, they make them out of old tractor discs. Um, I don't know if you've ever used one. But but they have a four-inch hoe that's like a tri- triangular. And it's basically a scuffle hoe. Um, and you can get down on your hands and knees and and weed very uh, tightly spaced stuff um, with that that wrench blade. And I I really like that one. And how about you, Brooke? So I love this digging fork. It's this all metal digging fork. It's probably over 100 years old and I found it in my grandpa's garage. But it is the only digging fork. And believe me, we've gone through, you know, just tons of these things. It's the only digging fork that has survived our no-till vegetable production, you know, in a freaking baseball diamond. So so, you know, it's, it's tough stuff, and it's only got three tines now, but it still outworks all the other forks, and uh, yeah, it's the go-to fork for just about any any digging job, so that's my favorite. And Daniel, what's your favorite crop to grow? I would have to say melons. I really like, I mean, I don't know, I like eating melons, I like uh, having success at growing them. They didn't. They weren't successful this year, which was frustrating, but, but I, I, love, I love growing melons. I, I think they're a hard crop to grow, I find it challenging, but very rewarding. And Brooke, your favorite crop to grow? I have a lot, but eggplant's sort of my long-standing favorite. I adore growing eggplant. I, I just love harvesting, you know, big, voluptuous, glossy fruits. You know, they're just so heavy and weighty, and we grow a lot of different varieties. I'm I'm Sicilian, so I love preparing eggplant. I love eating it. I love growing it. Um, yeah, eggplant. Eggplant is fun for me, so... And Daniel, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I, well, one thing that, that I've always maintained is, is is don't get into debt or try to avoid debt as, as much as you possibly can. Um, and I think that there are some instances where it's it's necessary. And, you know, we sort of went into debt over the land. But, but you know, if you can try to avoid debt and just keep things within uh, your, your means, um, live below your means, then... 
at the end of the day, you're you're gonna come out okay on that. You know, I think that's the the, the biggest challenge for people is is um you know you want these bells and whistles on your farm, but at the end of the day, you can live without them. We've lived out without a lot of bells and whistles for a long time, and just dealt with what we've the situation that we've had, and that's why our farm is profitable and stable. And Brooke, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Well, I'm a huge perfectionist, and when I got into this, um, I just wanted everything to be perfect. I wanted all the crops to be beautiful. I wanted the fields to look beautiful, be manicured, be perfect. I wanted everything to thrive, and that was just so unrealistic. Um, And so I got very upset for many growing seasons initially over crop loss and failure and this, that, and the other. And, um, you know, in retrospect, it was ridiculous to cry over lost garlic. Uh, So I would tell my beginning farmer self just, to chill out and not sweat it and you're going to lose crops and you're going to lose them every single year and guess what you get to plant them all over again the next year um, and I've learned obviously the most from those failed attempts and um, it's made me a better grower so that's what I would tell myself. Brooke and Daniel thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Great fun. We enjoyed it. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 91 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for herbivore. That's herbivore like urban and vore. So U-R-B-A-V-O-R-E. You can support the show by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I want to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Whether you're supporting the show on a monthly basis through Patreon or showing us your love by leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, your support matters. Thank you so much. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review if you enjoy the show. Or talk to us in the show notes. Tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. Your reviews and referrals make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to a growing circle of listeners. And finally, I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions I received through the suggestions form on farmertofarmerpodcast.com. This show was a result of one of those suggestions. Please let me know who you would like to hear from, and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there, and keep the tractor running. <laughs>